Yes, hi guys. Um, so our topic, I guess, for today is um, tennis coaching in today's world and how, um, you know, how Mark especially will approach his uh, tennis coaching and the philosophies he, um, he has, um, the mindset, um, the beliefs and how we kind of, um, how tennis coaching has evolved from, from the past into today's world with all the social media and technology and um, the importance of language and communication that we'll get to a little bit later. Um, so yeah, very excited to hear your, uh, your experience, Mark, and your, your expertise. So um, for, I guess, not many people that don't know you, but for the people that viewing in that don't know much about you, um, maybe we could start off with a little introduction, a summary on, on, on yourself and, and how you became a, became a coach. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a long time ago now, but hopefully I can remember. <laughs> yeah. um, so I've been a coach now for three, four years. Uh, when I was 14, I first started coaching, um, and that was with my, my mentor, Michael Barak. We did some – he had me doing some stuff with some young kids, and uh, it evolved from there. I've, I've gone through a long journey of coaching uh, pro tour, ten, um, you know, going on and coaching on WCA, ATP. Um, working with a lot of great players, working from the grassroots. And I think the experience of coaching all left um, has, has taught me so much. And it's taught me so much about people in general. And uh, so that's been sort of my thing um, to this day. I'm a coach educator in tennis Australia. I've been for uh, close to 40 years now. Um, I've been an assistant coach of the Richmond Football Club for 14 years, um, working in the VFL program mainly but also working in the AFL program before that. Um, and, yeah, basically, I'm a passionate uh, coach. I'm about developing people. Um, and, you know, I think now being a parent gives me a different perspective on, on coaching as well. I think it's, it's opened my eyes to so many different factors that I probably never thought of before I became a parent. So you, know, you really got to view in, in your thought process about around coaching. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a great, a great uh, you learn so much about yourself, so much about others. Uh, yeah, obviously it's, it's something I've done for a long time and I'll continually be a coach for the rest of my life. I think it's, it's the way of being, it's the job, it's, it's act to tell you respond and that's, you know, where I'm at. Yeah, fantastic. And um, I think uh, you hit it on the nail there that the, the passion is quite important. So coaching is a, as we know, it's quite a difficult and, and stressful job and it's um, a lot of hours in the court and even when we're off the court, if we have our own business, it's always work, work, work. And um, it's kind of hard to, you know, sometimes get motivated to keep going and going. But I think when coaches are motivated, it, it, it expresses onto athlete much better and it's a, it's a good environment, isn't it? Well, you're 100% right. Like, we are a product of our environment, okay? So, you know, whether you live in a house that is full of negativity, that's what you or you're full of positivity. Become, I think when you go to your tennis coach, needs to be, they need to be they need to be able to uh, lead the way. Because you are a leader in what you do. Whether you've got one player on the court, 20 players on the court, you run whatever it might be, it's infectious. And that, that environment you create is one of the most critical factors of, of creating um, energy for someone and so keeping them in the game. If I'm on the court, you know, no one, no one's going to stay there. You know, you, you've got to create that. So, you know, you're right. I mean, it's about a really good environment for people that, that uh, are on your court or even around you. Uh, to expect, um, you know, really create that. That's, that's excellent, Mark. I think environment is, um, is very important and, and it starts, you know, from the top down. It, it, I believe it really has to start with the coach um, and the coach has to be a motivator and, and someone there to support the, what the goals are for the, for the client. And if they feel comfortable, then I think, you know, they'll flourish more and the performance will be a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, you want to create a safe environment for people. That's the, that's the critical component of being a leader is being able to allow your environment to be safe and obviously positive uh, because people want to come to that, you know, this human brain itself is there to protect us. So if it doesn't feel safe, it's going to feel very vulnerable and, and feel extremely scared to be able to perform. So you want to create that environment that's safe and uh, positive and obviously that is, is there to create uh, success for the athlete. 
Yeah, absolutely. Very good. And um, so, Mark, let me ask you, so you, um, you know, you've been in the game for a long time and you've, you've employed a lot of coaches as a head coach and a, a Tennis Australia facilitator as well. So you see a lot of aspiring tennis coaches out there wanting to, um, you know, make this a career. Um, what are some, I guess, um, pros and cons or positives or red flags that you see with coaches today? Um, do you see anything that um, might be a red flag that you can kind of um, help the viewers understand that how maybe we can change these in the future? Yeah, I mean, look, obviously the motivating factors of what is the most important. So what is driving the coach is the, the underlying factor as to why someone is successful. If you think of, um, you know, I, I just want to do this for money. Basically, all you're thinking about is your job science. Um, you know, I, I've always had a motto or theory that if I do my job really well, I get, I'll get paid. Um, and, you know, I'll continually be successful because people will return and come back. There's no point me focusing on the dollar signs for that one hour or two hours I'm on the court because it's about consistency and the longevity of what you do. And you've got to create a strong brand. So, you know, I, I always talk to coaches in courses and, and, you know, even mentoring them. You talk about creating a strong brand and, and the brand that you have can be ruined very, very quickly. So it, it's, it's critical to ensure that everything you do is aligned with your brand. Um, you know, and it was even, and I know if you give an example, man, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty honest when I talk, but, you know, I got up this morning and I'm like, well, I better, better trim the beard a little bit and I better make sure that I present myself because it's, it's a brand that I have, right? Um, you know, I look like a, a homeless person you know, in bed this morning. I'm like, no, this is, not, <laughs> this is not the brand that I am. So I think it's important to create that brand everywhere you go. And, you know, it can be ruined very quickly. So um, ensure that you, you live up to that daily and you're consistent in your processes. Um, and make sure that you're driven by the right things, you know, whether you're driven by family, whether you're driven by success, whether you're driven by, you know, creating good players, make sure there's a, a, an internal drive that keeps you at that level and keeps your brand at that level for a long period of time. Yeah, absolutely. I think motivation, especially in, um, I guess, in any form of coaching, whether it's tennis or not, is, um, is a key element because, you know, you're responsible for so many clients, so many kids, um, you know, their parents, you, you have a lot of things to take under your wing. And, you know, in the end, um, it's, it's the environment you're setting, so you're responsible for it. Um, so I guess in that sense, um, it's, I think it's hard from my experience. I've seen for coaches to, to continually spend all those hours on court if you're not motivated. So, you know, spending 10, 12 hours on court is, as, as if there's any coaches watching, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And it's a different thing spending that, those amount of hours on court, but actually doing quality coaching. And day in, day out, that's, um, that's really difficult. And, and that's, that, that's important, isn't it? Like, you know, no matter what job you're in, it's about the consistency of what you do it at. You know, I can, I can go out there and do an amazing lesson for one hour, but is that, yeah. is that all it's going to be? Because the next hour you've got someone different. And the next yeah. hour you've got someone different. And everybody deserves your time and effort. And, and they're paying you the money, so you need to ensure that you are giving them the quality product. And that, for me, is, is always been standard. And I think having doing the job that we do, I think every single hour gets you motivated again because you go, okay, I'll get through this hour. All right, I've got a new player. Now let's start again. You know, start the, the wheels in motion. Um, and that, that's critical because every single player deserves that individual attention. And every single player deserves your, your effort, energy, time, uh, and, and the quality of work that you do. So it's not easy delivering a lesson at 8 o'clock at night. I get it. It's not easy delivering a lesson at the day and the morning. But if you choose to do the job, choose to do the job properly and, and uh, give people a quality, quality lesson, quality product. And, um, you know, that's, that's a, for me, it's interesting. Someone asked me the other day, I'll probably touch on this. Someone asked me the other day, um, what, what drives me? And I think over time, my driving factor, motivating factor has changed a lot. Yeah. You know, it's, it's changed a hell of a lot. Uh, you know, when you first start out coaching, it's, in, it's enjoyable. It's, it's fun. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm hitting tennis balls. I'm getting paid. This is, this is crazy. You know, how long did we hit tennis balls for Janae as players and, and you don't get nothing back? And you're like, hang on, what, what's going on here? So that <laughs> first factor of motivation was like, well, I can do what I love and get paid to do it. Um, then it moves on and it's like, well, hang on a sec. I've got a good player here and I'm motivated to, to create a good player and that, that drives you. 
And then you move to the next layer and it's like, hang on a second, I've got to start paying for a mortgage. I've got to start paying for bills a bit more, et cetera. So that the, the, um, the financial side comes into it, but you've, you've got the drive from previously, which the motivating factor was success. Then you have kids and you're like, well, I've got to, I've got to do the job for my family. I've got to put the food on the table. Um, but I still, if I create quality players, I, I can achieve good money. So there's so many different changes. And it's no different a philosophy is changing over time. It's you've got to evolve. And, and, you know, as a coach, you've got to evolve to where you're at. You've still got to remember that the player is at the forefront of your motivation. Um, and if they're at the forefront of your motivation, your financial rewards come in the, in the long term. Yep, absolutely. I think, um, I think you said it really well when you mentioned the, how the motivation changes. And, um, you know, like we're in such time, tough times at the moment and, trying to motivate yourself, whether you're coaching or whether you're trying to, you know, keep yourself healthy or fit or, you know, trying to do that work from home, it's very difficult. So I think finding your motivation, whatever that is, whether it's your children, whether it's trying to make yourself better, trying to, um, you know, plan for the future, I think you have to find that because especially in difficult times like this, it's, um, it's easy to get down in yourself. Oh, it is. And, you know, um, on the surface, everybody can seem fine, right? Um, you know, and, and on the surface, everybody says, oh, you're so positive, Mark. You know, how do you keep doing that? Don't worry. I, I go through tough times and it's, and it's yeah. not, I'm not hiding it at all because it's important to understand that the tough times make you better. And if you don't accept those tough times, you can't, you can't improve, you can't expand yourself. And, you know, I always tell my players, get out of your comfort zone. I've been out of my comfort zone for the last however long, for the last months because this whole you know, virus has destroyed people's incomes. It's destroyed my income. It's destroyed, you know, my uh, freedom a little bit. And it's, it's challenging and you've got to accept that. And, and I've accepted it. Unfortunately, I've had to accept it, but you know, there have been challenging times. And, and if you're out there and if you're listening to this and, you know, I hope it, I hope you understand that everybody's going through what you're going through because we're all in the same situation, but it's, uh, it's important to, to take each day as it comes and to stay present in the moment and not worry too much about, you know, you're not going to be able to pay bills in the, in the future. Just focus on the present. Get yourself through the, the day itself. You know, keep yourself occupied. Ensure that you keep a real good structured day similar to what you would do normally. And over time, it'll, it'll go away. This whole pandemic will go away and we'll be back to normal. But if you're back to normal and in a, in a negative mindset, you won't be able to take the next step in your life. So, you know, stick at it and hang in there because we're all going through the same thing. And, and uh, yeah, there's no doubt we all have challenging times. Yeah, and it, it, it builds that resilience that we always talk about as tennis coaches, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, in life, you have to suffer a little bit. You have to go through bad times to become stronger, to improve. And I think putting yourself out of that comfort zone is, um, especially in times like this, it's only going to make you better in the future. Yeah. Um, like Mark said, you're going to come out of it a stronger, more resilient, more motivated, hopefully, person. Um, so yeah, I um, mean, hopefully this thing will go away. It does drag on, but um, yeah. you've got to stay positive. Absolutely. And, and if you, if you liken that to tennis and I, I always liken life to tennis, so critical, but if we think about, um, as a tennis coach, if I don't put my player under stress, under fatigue, under, um, times where it, where it builds their character, then they're just going to be in their comfort zone the whole time and never grow as an athlete. You know, we're, we're going through that now in life. We're going through a time where we're being thrown into a situation where it's uncomfortable. We're out of our comfort zone. But this is where we grow. This is where we get better. This is where we get stronger. This is where we get tough. We get more resilient. So, you know, if we can't see past that and we're in trouble, we've got to understand that this is teaching us something and it's teaching us to, to think outside of, uh, you know, outside of the box a little bit and start to create different stuff like you're doing now. I think it's a great opportunity for, for coaches to, to do something different with what they do. So well done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, good, guys. So we'll, uh, we'll get a little bit more uh, tennis related now. We'll, uh, we're acting like philosophers here. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so a little bit before, um, we talked about how the game has obviously involved. It's, um, it's become more physical, technical. Um, players are just amazing today. Like you don't see many weaknesses in players. Um, for us coaches to kind of slow that down and really analyze what the players are doing, we, we tend to use more video analysis, um, a lot of videoing. So how do you see, I guess, the role of um, uh, video analysis and how science has changed and how has it kind of helped you in uh, assessing the players that you deal with? Uh, I think 
it's interesting because people are saying, you know, the game's getting better and it'll continue to get better. It will because we know more about it. Um, we've got more science behind it. We've got more data behind it. I work with a great data analyst um, who's part of what we're doing for our online product, um, data, uh, Shane Leonard from Data Sports Analytics. He's, he's brilliant at breaking down the game for me. Now, numbers, numbers and factual information are critical, so that's one part of your science and you break it down and then you've obviously got the visual side of it. Um, and it's important to be able to use all of that, your coaching eye and, your, and the art of coaching. So I think science without art is nothing and art without science is nothing. I think it's important to, to understand as a coach or as a tennis player out there, it's important to combine both. And if you understand the facts of the game, you can work back from the facts. Um, if you're working off opinion, we're going back to the 70s and 80s, right? Um, we've got to look at today's game and it's all built on factual information. It's all built on numbers. It's all built on visuals. It's all built on um, working smarter and harder. Um, at the same time, so it's art and science really working together as well from the physical perspective. So I think that to me is, uh, you know, where the game is. It's at a higher level because it's so um, broken down so minutely that we understand the intricacies of everything that someone's doing from their thinking to their move, stroke production. And uh, and we have more access to information now than before. You know, all you've got to do is go to Google and type something in and it comes up, right? You know, and this is this is the whole whole thing about um, about coaching is it's a great thing that we've got access to so much stuff, but it's also a really bad thing because now we've got the Google coaching, right? So, um, and that because everybody's an expert now, uh, not an expert through knowledge. You're an expert through knowledge and experience, and that and that is the most important part about any any coach is, you know, you've got all these bits of information everywhere, but the co best coaches in the world have the experience to be able to. Uh, join the dots and that and that to me is you know so important in the in the in the world is you know there's only very few people understand how to grab knowledge and turn it into uh, success and that is you know very important through science data and through opinion if you join three dots we get the results that we're looking for so um you know argument with my data analyst all the time shane we talk about it he's like you know, these are the numbers. I go, yeah, but this is what I'm seeing and this is my feel and this is what I'm going with. And we combine the two to create a great product all the time. So uh, that's you know, obviously the game has evolved. It'll continually evolve. And I think the game is going to a totally different place in the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years. So it's important to look ahead and, and see what is projected over time and the trends. And then obviously, you know, as a coach, you say to stay true to that and look to the future to see what we need to do. Very good, Mike. And, and do you think um, with all this, especially nowadays with all this online technology and a lot of YouTube coaching out there and, you know, everyone's an expert suddenly and there's a lot of information and, you know, for us experienced coaches, it's, I guess it's more easy to decide for what's right and wrong. But when you have, you know, clients that are not so experienced and, um, you know, they're looking at the Federer backhand and, you know, three weeks till you hit a Federer backhand and <laughs> these kind of things, it's hard not to kind of get in, uh, involved in that marketing and get sucked into that. But, you know, tennis, tennis is a process. It's a long process. Um, so, I guess, how do you deal, like, for example, if you have, say, a client come to you and you've been working with them and suddenly you see them change something because they saw something on YouTube or, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I saw this on YouTube, so I've been trying it out. And how do you, I guess, um, work your way around that? Look, I, I'm all for people researching. So the one thing that I never do is, is say to someone, don't go out and look at other things, you know. I used to because I was so protective of myself and I wasn't comfortable as a coach. So I used to protect it and say, don't go here, don't go this, don't do that. Right now, it's like, okay, I'm happy for you to research. The one thing I want you to do, though, is I want you to tell me if you think you want to change something or do something, just run it past me and we'll talk about how that relates to you individually because there are some great stuff online. There is some amazing, amazing knowledge, uh, technology stuff online that – learn from there's a there's some great people online great coaches and i don't want someone if i say to someone don't go and look online i'm stopping them from growing and researching which i really want them to do because the hardest thing for us as a coach is, or us as coaches is that um we don't have enough players especially in this country that want to go out and are so hungry to develop 
you know, we just don't have a lot of them. Now, if someone chooses to do that these days, I say to them, great, I want you to look at it, do it, but then come back to me and say, this is what I saw, this is what they said, this is what I take from it. I want to implement this into my game and we talk about it before we make change. Because it's very, very hard to create good habits. It's very, very easy to lose good habits. Yeah. So that is the, the the telling factor is that I need someone to be able to show me what they've learned, what they understand of it, and then what they're going to do with it before I say, yeah, go for it or no, let's, let's park that idea for a little bit. But it's, it's good that you're researching. And I try and encourage that because it's all about learning. It's all about growing. And, and I think we've got to continually grow as coaches as well as athletes. So, you know, I've had ones in the past where, They've just gone and done totally different of what I've been doing. And it's not, it's not an ego thing. It's more of a, well, hang on. The pathway is this and you're going that way. Now we're going to, at some point, we're going to break the player because we're both pulling in different directions. So um, I think the, the important thing is that everybody works the same way and, the, and works together. Um, and I'll give you a little example. If anyone is, is watching this, I hope someone is watching this because, um, you know, <laughs> we've got quite great. a few people, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's good. Um, if you go online and, and research in YouTube, go on and type in um, Formula One pit stop, um, pit stop crew. And you look at the videos about how people in the pits of a, of a um, Formula One team work together. There's three people that work on one tire, Yeah. right? Each tire, three people. And you've got two people that lift the car up. And within like three, four, five seconds, that car is gone. It's in there and it's out of there. How do they do that? They work as a team. Now, if you create that as part of a tennis player, and I always think tennis is a team sport, never an individual sport. You have the parent, you have the player, you have the coach, you have the fitness coach, you have the nutritionist, you have the sports psychologist, you have friends, you have teachers, you have everyone involved in that athlete is a team. Now, if, if we're pulling apart that team and that athlete, the player goes nowhere. If we're all working together, pushing them from behind, then that player gets a really good bit of momentum and can re really create some good some uh, good success. So um, I think that's a, a really important part. So research it, go online and look at uh, you on YouTube, Formula One Pit Stop Crew, because that just shows you the art of working together. And, you know, YouTube, the YouTube uh, wanderers, keep doing it, but work with your coaches and work with your team to be able to create a real clear pathway. Absolutely. I think it's crucial, especially now when we can't get on the court and you're not probably with your coach, especially in Australia uh, or especially in Melbourne, I should say. It's, it's critical to kind of go and learn more about the game, whether you, you know, watching technique online or whether you're watching tactics, how players perform. And, you know, for me, um, I think we can learn a lot from the pros, but we do have to keep that in perspective because they are professional for a reason and they've got in there through many, many stages of development. So, you know, there's a lot of videos online where they have, you know, lower ranked players or college players, which are still excellent. And, you know, something that players can relate to better instead of always looking at, you know, Federer or Rafa, because um, the things they do, it's they're outliers. Like we don't always yeah. want to be, be copying those, those kind of things. A hundred percent agree. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like those guys are, you know, three in a billion um, and, you know, or billion, you know, and, and they're, they've been at the top of the game for so long. There's no one, you know, you can't look at the best player and think you're going to be that. You've got to look at the average, you know, yeah. the, the average, you know, the average player between sort of 20 in the world and 250, 300 in the world, the players are so similar. Yeah. So similar. You know, you've got to take the average of that and look at that and go, well, that's where most people are going to land um, if they want to create this. Let's have a look at that and utilize those averages rather than the absolute minority, which is not even 1%. It's probably 0.00001%. Um, yeah. You know, so I think that's a, a really important. Because the thing is, if you don't achieve what those players are achieving in a short space of time, you can get dejected really easily. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's a mindset too, right? So I think uh, you, you're spot on with that comment. I think uh, we got to look to what the averages are more than what the pinnacle are. Yeah. And, and in the end, we have to compare ourselves with ourselves. I think. It's all about self-improvement. If we're yeah. always trying to chase to be like, you know, Roger or to be like Rafa or Novak, we're always going to get disappointed because, you know, the normal human being cannot do that. And if it could, tennis would be an easy sport, right? Yeah. 100%. So yeah, so we have to we have to keep that in mind. But um, so um, just 
continuing on with um, kind of this, this, this learning topic about tennis and how coaching. So what about, say, Mark, if you have players that are not at such a, I guess, elite level or don't have the aspiration of being professional? So say you have, you know, a club player that's, you know, playing at a decent level and they're looking to find that extra edge, you know, whether it's uh, beating their friend on the weekend or moving up a higher grade. What are some, I guess, um, tips you could give them or some things that they could work on that could kind of help them get to the, the next level, whatever that might be? I'll give you one quote. Don't practice something till you get it right. Practice it till you can't get it wrong. Love it. And pretty simple. Um, you know, no matter what you do in life, it's about self-improvement. I'm seeing, some, I'm seeing a wave. I'm seeing some, some comments on here. So Fiona Vanstone, thank you. Self-improvement, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's about bettering yourself every single day. You know, if you're able to hit... 10 forehands cross in a row tomorrow you hit 11 you know uh, it's it's not rocket science you know no matter what we do in life it's about being better than yourself yesterday and that's pretty much it so you know it's about going out there and spending time you don't get better sitting on your bum you, you get better by practicing you know you get better by being out there doing something you get better by researching you get better by learning you get better by you know making mistakes go out there and screw some things up every day you know the you know we see what the best players are doing we go oh wow that's incredible how many mistakes they made to get there like it's incredible it's amazing you know i've had great opportunities to uh to be on court with novak djokovic i've been on court with roger federer and th these these guys make mistakes it's okay like Trust me, they do. They make a lot of mistakes and, and they get upset and they get angry and no different to what we do. They're, they're human. Um, and, that's, and that's, you know, so critical to understand for any kind of player, any kind of player. So, you know, continually develop yourself, get better daily, work on your game, um, you know, spend time doing it, go onto a, a brick wall and hit some balls, go and serve, the, you know, on the court. If you're not serving well, get a basket of balls and serve some. You know, there's, there's no... It doesn't matter if you're trying to be elite or you're or you're trying to be, you know, just a good recreation player or you want to just play your local comp on the weekend. It doesn't change. You want to get better, you need to practice. You know, it's it's a, it's the, the simplicity of life, right? I got a little girl. She's in prep, and my my daughter, and she's learning how to read. You know, we tell her if you don't read every day, you don't get better. You can't read once five books and then not read again for the rest of the year. It's consistency of practice, and that's all it is. You know, if we can put that into every player that we work with, day in, day out, just do bit by bit. You know, don't do it all at once, just every single day. Be consistent on what you do. And, and literally, you will improve in life as well as to Absolutely. And it all comes down to that, you know, how self-motivated you are and mm -hmm. you know, how much you want to push yourself each day and, and keeping that, that eye on that goal that you have. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, and I've been a testament to this when I was younger, I never used to set goals for myself. It was always like, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to win this tournament or I wanted to be number one in Australia. And, you know, that's all well and good. But how do you get there? Like, what yeah. do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. You can't just jump from, you know, not winning a tournament to winning every tournament you play. Yeah. So Absolutely. I think it's important to set goals keep motivated to achieve those goals and then think about, you know, where you were a month ago and where you are now. And that's, I think if you guys have that simplicity and a way of thinking, as Mark was saying, you're, you're always going to be happy in life because you're getting better and that's all you can do. And it's funny because like I use the analogy of a, a like Google maps. Okay. So in Google maps, we type in a destination to get to, right. We want to go somewhere. We type in a destination and then what comes up is steps to get there. Right. So we all type in a destination in our life or in a tennis matches to win, but we don't type it into our GPS to say, these are the steps to get there. We just want to win. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, um, if you ask a hundred people when they went on the court, a thousand people, a million people, you know, have you ever thought to yourself, when I walk on the court, I want to lose. <laughs> There's no way. Right. So yeah. subconsciously we want to win, but it's the, it's the conscious brain that we're not focusing on enough. And the conscious brain, the front of the brain, is the process to get there. You know, if I want to be number one in the world, like you said, how am I going to get there? First and foremost, I've got to get my strokes right, my movement right. I've got to get my mindset right. And then, you know, you've got steps along the way and little benchmarks you've got to try and achieve. And then, you know, you keep working towards that. And 
I think if if people out there think it's a, a straight linear line to success, it's not. It's turn left here, turn right there, go straight 500 metres, turn left again, go around the roundabout. And it's about going around in different directions to achieve that goal. And I, I'm, I'm a really big believer that, you know, you can't just read up on how to be a tennis player and be a good tennis player. You yeah. know, you, you've got to grab the knowledge, you've got to practice the knowledge, you've got time and effort in, you've got to create experience, you've got to work your bum off day in, day out. That's, that's the critical part is people think that just because you know something, you can be good at something. No, you've got to work hard at it. You've got to make mistakes. You're going to fall over. You're going to get back. You know, you, you know, and as I said at the start of the, we started chatting, being a parent has taught me so much about, you know, learning, the learning capabilities with kids, right? So my, my daughter, when she first started to walk, what happened? She fell down. What does she do? She has no, no um, preconceived ideas. So she just gets back up and goes again. Yep. And then she falls down again. Now, if, if you think of that in tennis, go on the tennis court, you work on your forehand, it breaks down. What do you do? You get back up and go again. And, and you keep working at that. If you're in life and you take a wrong turn somewhere in terms of your decision-making on what you want to do in life, then you just get back up and you go another way. You know, you get lost in your GPS. It's okay. It reroutes itself and you, you go again. It's not, yeah. it's not rocket right science. Enough. You know, it's not rocket science at all. Like, okay, recalculating. You've taken a wrong turn. No, no crap I have. Okay, I'm going another way. And as tennis coaches, we have to allow that to happen a lot more often because it teaches us so many things the failure teaches us the success you know you, you don't become successful by just having your whole life you know you watch the the great stories of federer of Djokovic, Nadal. they weren't always successful they had tough times they you know they went through challenges and they had to overcome them and that's the, the way that tennis is you know get out there and practice daily and better yourself every single day and you'll become a better person as well as a better tennis player yeah absolutely that analogy is fantastic about you know, the path to destination. And I think that's a great one, guys. And, you know, us tennis coaches, you know, we, we, we're not perfect ourselves. We make a lot of mistakes. And I, you know, I'm a big believer in learning from the client. You know, I, I feel like when you're doing a lesson with a client, if the coach is not learning something, then it's probably not a good lesson. So it's not only that we're teaching the client something, we're learning something from them because, you know, in the end, it is about the client. It's about their development. It's about their goals. And as much as we can try to think about, you know, hit a forehand like this or hit a backhand like this, we have to find a way of making them understand it. And yep. in essence, that's teaching us better communication, better language. And it's, it's teaching us how we communicate. And it's, it's giving us some sort of betterment for the future of how to handle clients better. Yep. Um, so I always, you know, walk away from a day and I've learned – a handful of things from the clients and, and I look back at the way I communicate with them. I look back at things that haven't worked and, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of times where, you know, you just, you can't get through to the player. There's nothing you're saying is working. And I think that's a good challenge for us coaches to, to really try to find that way of explaining something to the client that we have in our head. That's so clear, but you know, how can we make this, this, girl hit this backhand down the line better just like and i think analogies are a great thing mark i think those analogies that you're putting forward you know in the end tennis is a fast game and we don't have time to think so if we can draw a mental picture in our in our mind and something clear that's going to click better than you know how technically how to do something so um analogies are great yeah thanks for sharing that with us no yeah it's, it's important because it connects your brain to a picture right you know, so um, as a as a coach, and the one thing that I, I put forward to a lot of coaches, even parenting, right, is that if the person you are is that is receiving your information can't picture what you're saying, then your information is not correct, right? So you know, kids and and players are, are not um, young adults; they're kids, and they're kids because they don't have the experience that we have gone through. So you know, if if I um, in the past have fallen over in a pothole and broken my leg. And I try and stop my kids from falling in that pothole and breaking the leg because I know how much pain I went through. And I yell at them for, for stepping in the pothole. Then I'm doing the wrong thing because they haven't got that experience that I've had and gone through in the past and haven't been hurt by what has happened. So they don't quite understand the consequence of what I'm trying to say to them. So 
you know, as the coach, the, the player needs to be able to picture the images that you're giving them. Now, if you're talking too much, the player cannot envisage what you are saying. So you've got to speak clear. You've got to have clear goals about what you're trying to say. You've got to be able to get the player to repeat it back to you. So therefore, the language and everything that they are saying, you get the understanding from them. So I was guilty of this as a coach of saying, oh, do you know what I mean? And they go, yes. <laughs> okay, well, no, they probably don't know what I mean. Um, so, okay, can you explain to me what I just said to you? And they look at you like, uh, really, do I have to? Um, I have no idea what you just said to me. Okay, cool. So I didn't say it properly. I need to rephrase the way I said it. And it's important to engage the athlete that way, get them to repeat what you're talking about, and then say, okay, can you picture what that looks like? And that, to me, is a critical part of communication that, you know, as a parent, I've learned so much through that lens as well. And we all look at three things through different lenses. Before kids, I had a different lens. And now with kids, you have a, obviously a different lens as well. So, and that's important to, to understand is that people will, if they, will be able to execute something if they can picture it. And if they can't picture it, then they won't be able to understand what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good, uh, good outlet to the next topic we want to talk about is that communication and language. So I think, you know, kind of tying that in with coaches today, um, versus the past, I think um, language and communication has become more and more important part of coaching, whether it's tennis coaching or like yourself, AFL. Um, you've got to have that, that, that tone correct, don't you? You've got to have the, the words that are coming out of your mouth um, really impact the player and really, um, you know, kind of click with them. And, you know, just touching on that, Mark, so, you know, with your experience coaching, obviously females versus males and, kids versus adults and uh, even people from all over the world. Um, let's start with how do you, um, how do you guess handle the female athlete different than the male athlete in terms of your communication and language that you use? Yeah, well, I guess this is one of the most complex conversations I think that we, we could have around language because every single person that you come into contact with in your life is going to receive information differently. Everyone. And as a coach, parent, whoever it is out there, it's important that you are a, a chameleon. You can, you can mold yourself into who you have in front of you. Yeah. That is, is the, the most critical part of coaching. If you've got a five-year-old athlete, you communicate to them differently than if you have a 25-year-old athlete. If you have a pro to a player, have a developing player at the age of 10, um, everyone deserves to be spoken to the way that they're going to receive it. Now, that's no different to, like you just asked me, the male and female athletes. Um, it's a bit of chalk and cheese, to be honest. Okay, so um, when, you, when you create a relationship with a male player compared to a female player, the male player at the end of a match walks off and accepts responsibility, accepts playing poorly, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of the time, the females hold on to that anger and that, that, um, that emotion a little bit longer. Um, and that, that to me was a real challenge when I first started coaching on the tour was I didn't quite understand that. I didn't understand people as much as I do now. I didn't understand how people respond as much as I do now. Now, when someone, a male player loses a match, they want to talk about it quickly and then it's move on, get to the next day and, and we're okay. The female players will hang on to that for a day or two or three or 10. <laughs> and it's like, it's like we're trying to get that out of their system as soon as we can, but they hold on to that emotion a bit longer now female players also really um, love the relationship factor they love to have a strong relationship with their coach they love to trust them um, talk to them a lot you know open up to them the male players like the relationship side of it but they're happy to go with their mates and go for a beer after matches and and, and it's a little bit different you know it's uh, yeah. it's different in that respect so you know from a tour perspective that's exactly what it's like and even when you draw down to younger kids you know I, the girls um get an emotional attachment to their coach and that's what i love is that you can really um after a little while sometimes it can take a little bit of time for for female players to break down their wall i just saw someone join on here before who's a parent of one of the girls that i've coached and she'll be able to testify that you know it's it's a very similar situation with her daughter it took a few years for us to be able to really connect and bond really well uh, and you know it's taken that time but now there's that trust element you know we've gained an emotional connection which is really nice 
and the communication becomes a little bit more in depth rather than a oh, high mark. How are you going? Yeah, my forehand feels okay. Yeah, my backhand's all right. Um, <laughs> and now, I'm like, hey, you know, Mark, I feel like you know, in these situations, I feel like my forehand's good, but in these situations, my forehand's not so good. You know, what do you think I can do? And then the questions start coming back the other way as well. So, you know, I think the relationships, no matter who you coach, male and female, relationships are critical because that creates trust and creates bond. And when you've got that bond and trust, I think you can communicate in any way that you like and the player will listen. And, you know, I've I've learned that a lot through footy. And um, I did see two guys that I've coached at footy um, come up here before, and I'm not sure if they're still watching. But, um, you know, know, at the footy club at Richmond, We've just built a, a culture of um, being unified, a culture of being able to be yourself and be vulnerable and accept who you are. And I think as a coach, if you can accept who you are and you let people into your world, they'll let you into their world. And, you know, I'm really big on being open and honest with my athletes and, and let, let them understand about me so then they can tell me about them. And if I know more about them, I can coach them better. And that's that's the bottom line is being able to, coach them the best way I can and to do that I need to be in their mind and in their body to understand what they're going through yeah absolutely and I think just summing that up that the trust is important um, you know us coaches we have to trust the client that you know they're motivated they want to learn they're coming to us because you know they're not pushed into it that they want to come to the to the coach hopefully and then the client also has to trust the coach. So I think it is a two way, two way street. And I think it's important that when you build that trust, everything, the words that come out of your mouth make more sense, don't they? It's like, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And, and to build that trust, sometimes it's not easy, is it, Mark? It's, uh, oh, it's a process. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes so much time. Like I've, uh, I've worked with players and, you know, like the, the girl I was talking about before I mean we've been together now as player coach for eight years and it took me a good five years to get that build the build of trust build of um, comfort and uh, the ability to be able to to let go of those walls that are in front of them Um, you know so many people have been burned in, in life right and you know every relationship you go into once you've been burnt you've got a wall up you've got some sort of wall in front of you that you don't want people to come past and it can take time to chip away at that and i think that you know as a coach you have to understand that it's not going to happen overnight and you know if a player doesn't respond to you in 12 months time it's okay it, it can take a lot of time and you know it, it once you build it though you, you've got it. and it's it's a it's a great feeling when you've got a, a good trust and buy-in with your athlete and a good relationship because then your your messaging is so much clearer um the execution of your messaging is so much better um and you just you just let down that wall and all of a sudden it, it magic happens. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I just see Isaac, one of our um, University of Melbourne national team players joined and, you know, it's a good time to join because I was just going to talk about that, um, that team environment that you talked about before, Mark. Yep. So we can touch on that a little bit. So, you know, we always, we play eventually for ourselves, tennis, you know, people look at it as individual sport. Um, that's, I guess, true when you're on the court, but everything up until the court is, it's your parents, it's your coach, it's your, like you said, your school teacher, yeah. it's maybe your kids, your brothers, it's, it's, what are you doing or up to the time you come on the court? And I think uh, a big uh, reason why people succeed is because they have, you know, positive, positive life. They have like positive emotions with their family, they have a happy life at home and, and on the court things, you know, get better. So there's sometimes when you're feeling that, anger on the court or whether you're feeling that frustration you know maybe it's not your tennis maybe it's something else that you need to fix in your life or get motivated by or maybe you need to find another way to to perform better because on the court you know things are very stressful right everything's about learning and you know you, you touched on it before like we make mistakes like even the pros make mistakes and yeah. you know only what 55 percent of points are won on the tour by the top player in the world for so 45% yeah. of the time that person's losing and yeah. that's a lot. And, and we lose more because we're not, you know, number one in the world. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, guys really take a look at um, your team around you and, you know, what, what, what you're bringing to the court and, you know, that might give you some answers of, of your struggles as well, mentally at least. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because 
uh, there's another bit of advice I give to um, coaches is when you're looking at a player's game and they're, they're on the court hitting balls and they make a mistake, the first thing coaches do is, th- is talk technique. Oh, my God, it kills me. It actually, like, it's, it's my pet peeve in coaching. There's ways people can make a mistake. Technical, tactical, physical, mental. It could be perceptual. It could be they've come on the court and they are in the worst mindset, you know, and not nothing they do is going to work. So I think we've got to stop as coaches just analysing the poor things people are doing and just think it's technical. It, it's not. It, there's so many aspect, uh, aspects of the game that we've got to look at. And um, I think it's it's important to understand what the players are going through. It's important. And, and that comes back to the trust and the relationship, right? If you don't have that, then they're not going to tell you what's going on. You know, like, you know, I'm coaching a couple of players at the moment, um, two of players, and I've created such a strong bond with them that they tell me what's going on off the court, which is great. So if they have a bad day on the practice court, I know exactly why. Or they come to me and they go, I've had the worst day and this is what's going on. And we just stop hitting. We don't hit. Why? Because we're going to do more damage than good. Right. So, you know, I think it's important to understand that. And, and I've, I see a question here from, uh, I think you've got a question there from your university guy there. Is it? I love how. Uh... No, I'm, I'm not sure who that is, but it's a good question. Yeah. I was going to, if you want to touch on that now, you can. But it's, uh, yeah. It's I think soon, I think soon to be father. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. It's um, yeah, it's amazing. I, I've um, you know, being a father myself, it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool thing. It's it's something you're going to screw up. Trust me. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm doing that as well. But um, it's funny because I, I um, people always say to me with my kids, um, and obviously a relationship perspective is, people say, are you going to get your kids into tennis? Um, and I always say, I hope they don't play. <laughs> I know <laughs> the same thing. Yeah, game has done. You know, has, has shown me. I just don't, you know, want them to play. But my oldest daughter has been bugging me week in week out. Daddy, get, we play tennis. Daddy, we play tennis. So now I'm in lockdown. I'm sitting in the garage and we play tennis every day. Now I don't want to be coach. I want to be dad. And I think that's important. That there's a fine line between, hey, who's the coach? Who's the dad? What's your role? My role is dad, and my role is get out there and play with my daughter, not teach her tennis. Now, if she wants to learn, she can ask me questions, but I'm not there to teach her. So um, I, I want my daughter to to come to me if she wants that because if I push myself onto her, um, then she's going to hate the game and she's going to hate me. Yeah. And I see it happen too often. And I generally see it with um, people that haven't been a coach. And that's that's the concern is that that parent goes – I know what I'm doing. I've been watching YouTube clips. I'm going to do this. You should be doing this. And it's like, well, hang on. Wait a second. You're a dad. That's your role in the team. Stick to your role. I'll be the coach. You be the dad. That child over there is your daughter. You've got to parent your daughter and that's okay. Right now, if we all play our role, we go really well. And I think just to answer your question, I mean, have, have fun with your kids. That's what that's what will motivate them, and you know, right now we have fun. I go out there and play games with her, and just it's an amazing fun. I actually enjoy it. Um, I'm not teaching her anything. She just, you know, if she if she doesn't hit the ball well, she doesn't hit the ball well. It's, yeah, I'm not judging her her success on on my coaching. Um, I'm I'm judging her success on is she smiling, is she happy, and if she is, great. I'm doing a good job because that's my role is to be dad, and my my role as dad is to enjoy. Right, so I um, hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if it does, but um, yeah, good luck with your, with your newborn. Yeah, congratulations, uh, J-Man. That's very exciting. And uh, like Mark said, you know, you, you cannot predict the future. You know, you cannot say I'm going to make my ch- son number one in the world or my daughter number one. That's a huge mistake because yeah. you're just going to bypass all the childhood, the living, the fun, Yep. You know, and, and, you know, there's there's a lot of research with early specialization, as you probably heard of, Mark. You know, you've got to let your kids become athletes first. You've got to let them play a multitude of sports. And, you know, and then when puberty sets in, you know, then you see what happens. The body changes, you know, kids lose focus. They get distracted. There's so many elements out there. And, you know, we cannot start controlling it from the minute they're born. And, you know, it's with my son. I went out there with him the other day and, 
he bugged me to play tennis because he saw me watching tennis on the computer. And uh, it was a disaster. And, and, and he just, he hits the ball well, but he does not want to listen to me. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, instead of me like saying, no, you got to do this, you're losing time, you know, this kid five year old in the world, so good. <laughs> we just said, you know, we're done. Let's go do something else. And uh, yeah. so I think, you know, take it easy, J-Man. Uh, become a father first that's that's going to yeah. be a struggle trust me without without tennis <laughs> and um yeah i think um that's a great question yeah and guys if you have any questions please shoot them through um we're uh, we've got a few more things to talk about but uh, yeah shoot any questions you want anything tennis life related go for it um yeah absolutely and, and the, that's, the thing, that's the thing with life isn't it like it's um you know for being a dad there's no manual <laughs> you know like <laughs> You know, it doesn't come with a manual. You you just you you do it. You screw things up. You know, um, when my wife and I we had our first child, Mia. We <laughs> were in the hospital, and the first four days went like a dream. It was like incredible. She was sleeping, eating, you know, whatever. We went, oh, we're ready to go home. You know, we're we're, we're perfect now. We know what we're doing. And we got home, and that night she cried for about twelve hours. You know, like we <laughs> couldn't get sleep. And we had no idea what to do. We tried to burp her. We tried to put a dummy in. We tried to put her to sleep. We tried. To, and there's just no manual for it, right? It's trial and error. And, and, that's, and that's life and that's tennis. And it's obviously trial, error, make some mistakes, learn from them, grow them, develop. That's, that's how we go. That's it. And that's tennis. You just, you're going to yeah. learn every single day. And us coaches, we're learning every single day, believe me. Yeah. yeah we're, really. we're learning a lot. Um, that's great, Mark. So, like, let's uh, – so we're in lockdown here in Melbourne. I'm sure a lot of the people in the world are in lockdown. So – how can we improve when we can't step on a tennis court? What what things can we when we do at home? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Like, uh, well, you can read a blog that I'm doing at the moment, which will be coming out very shortly. Um, so yeah, this week I've got a little blog on basically tennis skills that you can do at home, um, and I've got a video that I put to that. But pretty simply, you don't need a tennis court to get better. You can have a wall. You can volley on the wall. You can hit on a wall. Um, you can do hand-eye coordination. Um, you can do some physical stuff, you know, obviously there's so many things you can do physically. You can do some strength, you can do some balance, you can do some coordination. Um, you can do anything like that, flexibility, mobility, all that sort of stuff you can do at home. That's, that's easy. But the one thing that I find that as tennis players, we neglect is developing our brain. Now our brain is our most uh, important tool in life, in everything. In tennis, we are making that many decisions every single second that we're on the court, but yet it's the most under-practiced skill that we have. So if you think about like, you know, um, there's a lot of stuff around mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness is the ability to stay present, right? In tennis, we have to stay present. You know, you're hitting your ball, you're present to where it's going, you're watching in the cue where the player is moving to, how they're moving there. You're watching what kind of setup they have with their with their stances. You're then reading where the ball is going to go, where you have to recover to, where they're going to hit it, how they're going to hit it to you. Is it high, heavy, spin, short, flat, wide, speed, slow? And you're like trying to make all these decisions, right? But it's the least practice skill. So spend 15, 20 minutes a day mindfulness you know get some music going and and just be present and always bring your attention back to your breathing because it's about when your mind wanders bring it back to that same spot all the time so for me that is a critical component so that's one part of the brain that i think can be really practiced a lot more the second part is the mind doesn't understand the difference between fact and fiction so if you can watch matches and keep your eye the whole time watching the ball watching the game watching the movement when you go back on court, it's almost like you've been continually training because your eye is so far in. This is the, that's a critical component. Don't just watch the match and spectate it. Watch where the balls are going. You know, track the ball. See where it's landing. See how they're hitting it. See what they're doing when they're in defense, neutral, offense. You know, really dissect it in your brain so your brain is connecting the pieces and the pictures so when you go on court, you can replicate that as, you know, as you're playing. And it will happen subconsciously if you watch enough. So uh, I think that is, you know, it's in, important to understand that the mind can be practiced so much when, you, when you're you know, not, not training and not on the court. And, you know, it's all over the world at the moment. So anybody can be doing it everywhere. So no matter where you're coming to us from, please make sure you're, you're developing your mind because that's your most important tool because every thought creates an action. 
and then every action will then have a corresponding thought. So your first thought needs to be a really solid one, process driven to create a really successful outcome in your action. Your action then feeds off and gives you your mind emotional, uh, emotional feelings. So it could be from a positive or negative one and then it will respond to that as well. So it's important that the first thought is a really good one. That first decision is a really good one and then just make sure you practice it to get it stronger. Fantastic, yeah. Hope you guys uh, digest all that. That's excellent. Um, yeah, we, working on the mind is everything, right? And um, you don't need a racket to do it. You don't need any equipment. You yeah. can just do it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, and guys, if we get kicked out here, I'll start the video again because we're approaching the hour. Um, so, yeah, Mark, if we get kicked out, I'll invite you again. So just jump sure. on again, guys. But, uh, yeah, you can do problem solving. You can do puzzles. You can play mind games in your phone, whatever, anything yeah. to sharpen the mind. And, um, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of research between shadow swings, you know, the, the swinging the racket without hitting a ball is just enough stimulation for the brain as if you hit a ball. There's a Absolutely. lot of research behind that. Uh, becoming a better athlete. I mean, most of the mistakes recreational players make is because, you know, they're not strong enough or they're not, you know, balanced enough. So, you know, when's the better time to do it now, you know, when you're at home and you have nothing else to do and, yeah. uh, you know, find, find your motivation, find a player that you like and, copy him or her or you know play some music you like or you know just find a way to do it guys and it only takes a few minutes a day you don't have to do hours and hours a day yep absolutely 100 percent agree totally agree you back in um yeah <laughs> doing things at home you know and i have you know a lot of um clients that i'm working with from home and you know doing the zooms and you know going through their strokes with them doing the the fitness component and um you know, I see it. I see they're improving their movement just in their garage. And I think when they get back on court and when the time is up, they're going to be so much better and they're going to be so much better for it. And um, that they're the ones that we're going to see improvement from right away. You know, the ones that have been doing chipping away every single day and, and doing something to help their, help their game. Yeah, and as we said, oh, it's about bettering yourself every day, right? So, yeah. you know, find, find things to make you better and... Um, and just keep doing them like it's consistency that we do it at that makes you the best that you can be. So just keep doing it day in, day out, you know, bits and pieces every single day. And um, I'm sure, you know, we're all going to come out of this at some point. So come out of it stronger, come out of it better. And, uh, and yeah, obviously physical and mental things are the two things that you can do um, without a tennis court. So yeah. you know, keep doing And nutrition, you know, there's nothing. I, I'm, <laughs> That's, that's a whole other day, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to say I've got the best nutrition, but um, you know, you just just be really cautious of what you're eating because it can it can become quite easy to stuff your face with a packet of Tim Tams and a coffee every time you're at the computer. So, um, not saying yeah. I do, um, maybe half a pack, but just look after yourself and uh, make sure you stay healthy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Diet is important, and you know, most people food is uh, food is kind of makes them happy. So yeah. Um, yeah, just just be careful. Just do the work, and you can eat. Yeah, very <laughs> good. Okay. So a little bit about you. So what are three, I guess, lessons you've learned from all your experience as a coach? If you could pick three important words that really resonate with you and that you kind of carry on the court every day, what would those be? Tough yeah. question. Bro. Tough question. Uh, I think the first thing is consistency. Um, be consistent in everything you do, in the way you treat people, in the way you are, in the way you act, uh, in the way you go about things. Consistency can be, you know, one of the most underrated uh, tools that you have. So, you know, it's that's critical for me. Um, the second thing is probably experience. So you can never get anywhere in life without experiencing stuff. And I think just continually experience um, everything that you do, um, more and more often and make more mistakes doing it so you can't buy experience you can you can buy knowledge you can read you can do stuff like that but the experience is is a big one and probably i'll give you two more be willing to make mistakes yeah um i think mistakes for me are important for learning and i think that we need to make mistakes to be able to learn um, and don't be scared of making them and as you said like uh, i think one of the stats my stat guy comes up with is that Rafa Nadal has won 56% of points on clay over his career. Um, and he's got a 90% win ratio on clay. So, you know, be prepared to, to lose, be prepared to make mistakes. And the fourth thing is don't be scared to put yourself out there and be vulnerable because vulnerability creates connection. So 
by allowing your walls to be dropped, you allow the players' walls that you coach to be dropped. And don't don't ask someone to to drop their wall if you're not willing to do it as well. And I've learned that as a coach. I used to be, um, I used to think that vulnerability was a show of weakness. It's not. It's a show of strength. And um, I've had challenging times in my last few probably few years, and um, I've been uh, willing to share them, and I've been willing to accept them. And when you accept them and you share them, you create a special bond with the people that you share with. And don't be afraid to, to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. Yeah, especially now in, in this world, you know, when we need that connection, we need to be close yeah. to family and friends and, you know, um, yeah, fantastic, Mark. Um, your favourite book or literature that you have read, if you could pick one, or a current one that you're, you're, you're reading? <laughs> if, if, if anyone watching this knows me, right? <laughs> Nick's watching? Yeah. <laughs> Come um, on, Nick, have a guess. Yeah. Uh, you know that I've got a library of books. Um, so if anyone's seen our videos on the tennis menu, um, you'll see that I've got uh, a, a library of probably about three or 400 books, right? Um, I'm a big advocate for books. Have I read them all? No. <laughs> um, so they're just for show, huh? Yeah. yeah, no, well, it's funny because I get a book and I get really excited by it. And I read, I read a certain amount and I get what I want out of it. And then I, I, I let it go. Um, it's, it's quite, my attention span is bad. So, um, you know, I, I get a book and I go, yep, love that bit of it. Um, and I just put the book down and I write stuff that I'm, I really like, and then I don't come back to it. It's really weird. Um, so that, that's probably it. But if there's anything that I can, um, uh, probably fill people in on, if you, if you're into self-drive motivation kind of stuff, um, Alistair McCaw is probably my favorite guy to follow. I think um, he's on the ball with a lot of things. Uh, he's in, got an incredible amount of um, knowledge on, you know, the mindset and, and being a champion minded person. I think that's some great stuff. And the other book actually I did read, so it's probably the one I did finish um, is, uh, yeah, what's the, what's the word of it? Uh, the name of it. Uh, Dr. Phil Jaunty is the, is the author. He's a sports psychologist in Queensland. He worked with the Brisbane Lions. Um, it could be. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Yeah. Um, uh, it could be uh, knowing yourself and others, or motivating yourself and others, or something along those lines. Um, but uh, incredible book. Um, talks about personalities of people, and understanding people is the first step in understanding coaching. And I think that if you can find anything that is about personalities and about um, putting people in the categories of, of their personality, I think you should look at that really wholeheartedly. And, and if you're a coach or even a manager, um, get some books around personality profiling. Fantastic. And your, um, your biggest pet peeve, Mark, something that really doesn't sit well with you? Um, when Nick Gissing tells me that my content's crap. Um, <laughs> the same as me. Yeah. <laughs> um, nah, look, I think um, my biggest pet peeve in coaches is that they make it about themselves. Now, coaching is not about yourself. It's about others. Um, leadership is not about yourself. It's about others. It's how you make others feel. It's how you make others become. So that when I watch coaches go out there and say that I developed a player, I did this, I did that. No, you didn't. The player developed themselves. So that's my biggest pet peeve in coaching. Um, yeah, that's probably about it. I, over time, I've probably become a bit more relaxed in life. I used to be pretty hot-headed, as you probably well know, Mr. <laughs> the doubles court. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You probably have to calm me down. You were the calming factor in my life at that, at that point. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, I think I think in terms of um, now pet peeves I, I i sort of am pretty comfortable within letting things go and i don't let think too many things affect me i only i only control what i can control in life and that's and that's what i do and how i respond and that that's how i live my life now i've changed a lot in probably the last 20 years and um you know i think i've grown and evolved as a person and i hopefully continually do that as well yeah excellent fantastic um so yeah, just um, so last thing, Mark, and where can I guess people find you and um, some of the things you're currently working on? Yeah, um, well, you can find me anywhere. I'm probably yeah, I'm, I'm actually hating myself at the moment with social media. <laughs> media. Um, but um, on the tennis menu, 
Um, so the tennismenu.com is where our website is. And I host a lot of our coaching videos um, for athletes, parents and players to be able to, to, to go on, uh, sorry, coaches to be able to go on and learn from my experiences in coaching and life. Um, so that's our main thing. So we're all over social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Uh, I've got my own personal accounts, just my name, um, at Mark Support, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever. Um, and at Melbourne International Tennis School is where I do all my coaching. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm out there every day of the week and i head coach of Maribyrnong Sports Academy. So, um, yeah, so I've, yeah, I'm pretty much anywhere. So, look, I, I'm more than willing to, to help anyone out. You know, at the end of the day, it's about all of us, you know, coming together as a community and helping each other. So if you want to get in contact, please do so. Um, I think it's important that we, we share and grow together and, and uh, oh, let's get through this pandemic first and then let's uh, keep, keep tennis at the forefront of people's minds and, and keep the sport going because uh, obviously we're, we love it. And we've done it all our life and uh, let's keep it going. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, that was excellent. I really appreciate your time and I'm sure the viewers appreciate your time and um, it's been an excellent chat and thanks for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. And, uh, and as a friend, it's, it's good to see you again and good to talk to you again. Um, Mark and I used to, be, used to be doubles partners back in the day. Yeah, we and, did. We did. Long I, just, time ago. I just wish, I just wish we would have been more successful had you been able to serve twice in a doubles match. Um, but we yeah, you're now. Yeah, I, uh, I I didn't mind them off at the net and just plucking them out, pl plucking them away. But um, but yeah, we did have some fun. It's always good to you know tennis creates uh, relationships, and obviously we've been you know friends for a while. And yeah, it's been good to to see you again, mate. It's been a, a long time, long time. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, guys. And uh, if you have any questions, um, just feel free to contact either one of us. But um, we'll just uh, we'll leave you there, guys. Thanks, Mark. Have a good no. time with your family and stay safe. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your comments too. I've been been trying to trying to read it while I'm while I'm talking. I'm not yeah. great at multi multitasking, as my wife tells me all the time. But um, but <laughs> your comments. Uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, please hit me up anywhere, and um, let's let's all stay in touch and stay connected. Very good. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Take care. Cheers, mate. Thanks, buddy. Cheers. See you, mate. Bye.